The war by the shore was total chaos. I mean, it was absolutely the most bizarre Ryder Cup as far as start to finish, off the course things happening, on the course things happening. The Gulf War was happening. You had President Bush the first taping a message of inspiration for the team in a local radio station did wake up the enemy phone calls to the European players. And there was really a lot of animosity and jealousy and rivalry. And Europeans felt disrespected. And Seve, Azinger, Payne Stewart, Ola Thobel, these guys were not just players. It wasn't just about the golf. I don't think there's ever been a Ryder Cup that had that much personality. I think there was a lot of pressure on the U.S. side to get the Cup back for the first time since 1985. I mean, the finish might not have been artful, but it was certainly the most intense and the most memorable Ryder Cup ever. Mark O'Meara playing with Watkins with this long birdie. I just remember how close all the matches were. You know, there were some blowout matches, but at the end of the day, it was very, very tight and very close. For an eagle. We had a player or two that weren't playing at the top of their game, so you know, we were kind of iffy. Are you kidding me? The last few holes at Kiel were really, really difficult. You know, we saw what happened on 17. Pressure of the Ryder Cup is engulfing everyone today. There was a lot of tremendous golf played over the first two days, but what everyone remembers is just how wrenching the Sunday singles was. When I saw the pairings that I was in the last group against Bernard, I, I kind of started doing, well, here's our score now, and I started doing a kind of a quick rough tabulation. Well, our guy's playing well, he should win that match or lose. I mean, I kind of did a little running rough total, and I told my wife, I think it's gonna come down to my match. So sure enough. The match was very close all week. Everybody basically was finished playing, and Hale and I stood on the 15th tee box, and I was two down. I won 16 and 17, and the American team had a one-point lead. So if, if I don't win my match, we lose the Ryder Cup. I don't know what he's saying, but man, I was, was as nervous as a cat. Probably more nervous on a golf course than I've ever been. The thing that comes to mind looking at Irwin was that he was a loner, and team golf gave him an opportunity to uh, sort of reinvent himself. Langer was an interesting figure because match play always comes down to short putting and he knew he'd been fighting the yips through his entire career. So you had two people for whom in their personal journeys to get there, there was a lot going on. And then outside facing them, you had millions and millions of people hanging on every single thing that they did. That last hole was probably the most intense, nerve wracking 15 minutes of golf I've ever watched. Hale hit a real bad snap poke off the tee. I hit a good tee shot and somehow his ball was just on the edge of the fairway and he hit a three wood down there and way short, chipped it up and didn't play a good chip and left the first putt about two and a half feet short or something like that and I gave it to him. And I think the untold story of that Ryder Cup was Langer conceded him that putt and it's like, did you watch this guy just play this hole? After what I just saw to Hale Orban, I want to see you putt that buddy. So I had a two putt from maybe 45 feet. By two putt, I win the hole and we keep the Ryder Cup. So I hit my first putt about six feet by. I couldn't believe that it was gonna come down to a, a five and a half, six foot putt. And after three days of competition, to have it come down to the final group on the final green with the final putt, I, I didn't want anybody to have to have that, that putt. Now I have a six footer. I saw two spike marks that were sticking out right on my line. You know, the line was left edge, and I always conferred with my caddy, Peter Coleman. We read the lines together, and he said, yeah, I see it left edge, but he said, what about the spike marks? I said, yeah, I see them too. So I, uh, I tried to miss them and put it straight. I found that this green breaks more from back to front than any of the other greens. So as Bernard's putting, I'm thinking, I hope he doesn't know what I know. I hope he doesn't know what I know. I had to make a decision. I probably made the wrong one. Not unexpectedly, he pushes it wide of the hole. Poor Longer's agony. And when Longer missed, it was so visceral, just that scream that, that came out of him and you know, throwing his head back. And 
I mean, he really looked like he'd been knifed in the back. I felt bad for the team. I felt bad for uh, myself and my caddy and everybody, but I did the best I could. And uh, that was a tough loss. He did say something to me, but it was all in a fog to me at, at that point. You know, there was so much noise, uh, celebrations going on. He gave me some consoling words. Then we've been, you know, great friends ever since. The importance of team spirit should be submerged by his charge. I think we all ended up in the ocean, you know. We all went out uh, to celebrate because it was kind of right there on the shore. And, you know, we were patriotic. We had the American flag out there and we were in the water and, and it's very special. Well, it's certainly the most important Ryder Cup ever played. That's when the public realized this was not some small, cute little golf event. This was the Super Bowl. This was the World Series. This was something big. It's always going to go down as the greatest Ryder Cup. Burner didn't lose that match. We didn't necessarily win. That was a standoff between two really good teams. But you talk about some great play and some great shots and, and great drama. That was it. No one won or lost that. It was terrific.